Uh, I forgot the name of the thing Tylenol is. Acetaminophen is paracetamol? Is that one of those? Oh, it's paracetamol. Okay. Oh, they're the same. Anyway, you just look this shit up. And there will be some sort of explanation here. Pharmacology or chemistry will be relevant. Pharmacology. Okay, so not completely understood means significantly understood. Because right there, it doesn't inhibit the function of COX. So, for example, if you know it does not inhibit the function of COX, you actually know something about the mechanism that is more than zero information. It's not enough because, like, if you only exclude things, you still have infinitely many things left. But it is information, and it is explanatory. But you need some sort of positive explanation about what's going on. It's not hard to make some up, but let's see what they say. It appears to selectively inhibit COX activities in the brain. It reduces COX, which must be oxidized in order to function. And it might do this other thing. So that's a potential mechanism. And it appears to be able to do this other thing, so that's another mechanism. Directly activate TRPV1, which inhibits pain signals in the brain. Look, the fact that it is metabolized primarily in the liver, and then knowing what it's metabolized into is also part of a causal explanation of what's going on and what the mechanisms are. That's part of the story. Another way to put it is people did not eat random things and test all of them to see if they did pain relief. It wasn't discovered by pure random chance. There was some sort of reason that they would eat this over a random thing from the set of all substances. Now, it, it is conceivable that they had an explanation like, here on Earth we only have 5,000 substances, so let's just try them all. Because pain-relieving substances that are not available to us won't do us any good anyway, so we need to find one that's available. They could do something like that. Hopefully there's something more satisfying, though, in the history of why they tried it. Usually there is. But trying it because there are a limited number of possibilities is an explanation about why you should try this one from the set of all infinite possibilities. And so, Tylenol blocking pain is not deeply mysterious. It's not a thing where you're like, how could that possibly be? When you have a correlation and they're claiming a conclusion that is impossible, that you cannot think of a causal mechanism where it would work or make sense, that's like a really big problem that comes up with some of their claims about like genes causing personality traits where they cannot actually come up with any causal mechanism that they can just make up that uh, can stand up to criticism. Whereas with Tylenol stuff, it's not hard to come up with a mechanism that is like plausible and reasonable, even if it's not the exact mechanism that's actually used. So you say, you know, the chemical you know, feeling pain is a chemical process. If you put the right chemicals into your blood, then it will interfere with the feeling pain process because chemicals can interfere with each other. Like something like that is an explanation of how Tylenol could work. And it's completely reasonable. So we do have an explanation that ingests the right chemicals and you can fuck with pain chemistry. So it's not inherently mysterious. <laughs> inherently mysterious. It's not a big deal. It's not implausible. You can, of course, come up with similar explanations for many things, including things I think are incorrect. Explanations are common. We have them all the time. They just don't focus on them in their research studies. The research studies are like, here's a correlation, and then they barely talk about explanatory and causal mechanisms. So they're not doing the critical discussion. It's not that there's no known explanations. The reason they're studying that particular correlation is that they do have an explanation. In every single case, they have some sort of explanation. That's why they're studying it. It's just that they don't do critical discussion of whether it's a good explanation and what the rivals are. They're not looking for, to poke holes in it and try to improve the explanation and compare it to alternative explanations. So they're bad philosophers. That's the problem. When he says, yes, it kind of was discovered by pure chance, he's qualifying, he's hedging. He says kind of was because he knows it wasn't. It was not pure chance. The thing Rat said is correct. So he wants to contradict it because he sort of sees how it screws over his case. But if he straight contradicts it, he's just factually wrong. So he just contradicted himself instead. He said yes, kind of, meaning yes except no. See, kind of what's going on here is that they have a, a hard time understanding the, cause, the causal mechanism for Tylenol. 
So they that delayed testing it. They, they they made it, and then they didn't test it in humans until 10 years later because they didn't understand it enough. This is... The lack of causal explanation is, like, making a big difference. Okay, well, that was Tylenol. What I don't like about deontology is I think they have arbitrary rules, basically. Like, don't murder. It's just sort of like... They declare don't murder as a principle. It's a premise. It's a starting point. It's their foundation. They can't argue, like, why not to murder. They just start there. Which makes it hard to argue with or discuss. Because basically they believe arbitrary assertions. They're not 100% arbitrary, but they're partially arbitrary. If that's not a main premise of deontology. It might be a main premise of a popular school, <coughs> school of deonto deontological thought. Deontology as a system is like neutral to what your beliefs or conclusions are. Don't murder and don't lie are commonly brought up deontology principles. Dichotomy, because consequentialism is dumb too. Like it's it's terrible that they try to choose one or the other. You can have principles, or you can look at practical empirical reality, but you don't get to have both and combine them. I mean, threshold deontology combines them, but it's sort of like. It's one bad way, and then in certain cases, they use the other bad way. That's, it's not actually figuring out a way to integrate reason with reality. Okay, so the main thing I wanted to do is work on this article. So, this is a critical review of George Reisman's book, Capitalism, A Treatise on Economics. And I started writing some comments on the review, but they're basically about the fact that the author doesn't know how to use commas, and then comments on Riesman's proofreading. And also, he writes very convoluted sentences uh, where he's trying to be a fancy, impressive person instead of clear, and then he complains about Riesman's style of not doing that. Although he says it in an ambiguous way. The writing style is very pretentious and anti-intellectual i would call it so he says things like a review must essay must certainly and frankly acknowledge the formidable various obstacles we have referred to this is so like highfalutin it's you don't have to say it this way you could just say like, you don't have to talk about what a review essay must do okay now this synthesis is interesting between classical and austrian i don't know as much about that one but objectivism's objective and Austrian subjective do not contradict each other. I, I can say that much. But I don't know about the subjective versus objective of classical econ versus Austrian. He's so pretentious. The circumstance that, as we already noticed, as we have already noticed, calls for brief separate attention in the following section of the essay. The basis for his adoption of these values has led him to... The basis of the adoption of values is not... The values themselves, it's the reason he adopted them. Which is allegedly loyalty, maybe? That's what he was saying earlier, which is uh, kind of a smear. Oh, this comma's wrong. The stridency of which comma cannot fail to alienate, which is, it's completely false by the way, he's exaggerating so much. Cannot fail to alienate? Go fuck yourself. Of course it can fail to alienate people. People could like it. People could uh, be tolerant. Anyways. I don't think this is just a proofreading thing. Like, I think he has conceptual confusion about how commas work. It's not just lazy proofreading. Like, I think he could proofread the sentence and not realize it was wrong. I think he doesn't actually know how to tell whether a comma is right or not. Okay, none of this so far. But at what point does Riesman make the specific error of... Where was it? Assuming the universal recognition of certain values. <laughs> where did Riesman assume that? Uh, he's arguing with these bad ideas specifically because he does not assume universal recognition of his values. Like, that's why he's bringing up that his disagreements with people, is because he knows disagreements exist. Yeah, so, disagree a lot. The problem here is that he is not an objectivist, he's a second-hander. So, on second-handed premises, Ries Riesman acted improperly, by not pandering and social climbing. Okay, so we're just gonna do the rest of this paragraph. Okay, so Riesman says, if views like an empty canvas or smears made by monkeys is a work of art, if those views can gain prominence, 
that reflects an advanced state of philosophical corruption. This is a reasonable statement that he he argued, he explained. Like, a conventional person could read this and, and not object to this sentence, given the premises in the previous paragraph. Okay, so, let's see. Right, we'll fold this on. Well, okay, so, Riesman says there is direct evidence of willful dishonesty, and then he quotes a person, so he says we have direct evidence, and he immediately gives a quote, so you don't have to be, like, Rourke to think if the quote shows dishonesty, then that's a reasonable statement, like, he could just be a blunt person stating the facts. Let's see if the quote, like, reasonably fits the assertion from a conventional viewpoint. To do this, we need to get some broad-based support to capture the public's imagination. As comma should not be here, but... Right, that, of course, entails getting loads of media covered. We have to offer up scary scenarios, make simplified dramatic statements, and make little mention of any doubts we may have. This double ethical bind we frequently find ourselves in cannot be solved by any formula. Each of us has to decide what the right balance is between being effective and being honest. So he's openly admitting that there's... He thinks there's a balance between being effective and honest, and he thinks dishonesty is effective, and he advocates some extent of partial dishonesty. Which you can see in the previous sentence as well, like, make little mention of any doubts we may have while offering scary, simplified scenarios and dramatic statements. So that's completely reasonable. All right, let's see what dishonest gang is like. This is a hypothetical with an art auction. Losing bidder had a maximum bid of 1,000, but now he'll bid 1500 so our man now has to bid over 1500 instead of openly over a thousand. This is unpleasant, but it's still in his interest. So our guy has a max bid of, say, $5,000, so he'll raise his bid from $1,001 to $1,501 in order to get the painting. And he's not happy to pay the extra 500 but it's still a good deal for him. So that's the kind of hypothetical scenario we're dealing with. Even in periods of rising prices, people should indeed still value the opportunity to outbid their rivals and the fact that sellers set prices high enough to achieve this objective for them. Okay, so if the painting was priced at $50, there would be, say, 50,000 people who would like to buy that painting. It's worth more than $50 for them. And it'll be sold on a first-come, first-served basis or to a friend of the seller or something. Whereas if the price is high enough, say $1,501, then only one person wants the painting and he gets it. So the person who most wants it gets it. So the high price helps him. If the price was $50, he'd have like a 1 in 50,000 chance of being the guy who gets it. So high prices help the people who want resources more. It helps them get the resources because it allows them to pay a higher price. To outbid other people. If the price is too low, you can't outbid them and you just get none. Is a problem that can happen. You can have shortages. When the price is too low, you get shortages and some people don't get any. If there's 10 of something and 20 people want it at a price of $10, you have a shortage and only half of them get it. But if the seller would just raise the price to $15, which is the, the price at which only 10 people are willing to buy it, then the correct 10 people buy it. 10 people drop out and, and stop bidding for it. And the other 10 people get it. That's what you want economically efficiently. It helps the people who most value things get them. So the problem is not the market economy. The problem is the presence in the market of a vast gang of dishonest bidders and dishonest buyers. A gang that bids and spends dollars created out of thin air in competition with their earned dollars. As later discussion will show, the source of these dollars created out of thin air is none other than the government, and the dishonest gang consists of it and of everyone else who demands and receives such fiat money. Okay, so he's saying that the government prints money and uses it to bid for things, and this raises prices. And so the thing people should be mad about is not that the prices are too high, it's that the government is causing the prices to be higher by printing a bunch of money. In other words, it's inflation. Okay, so he's calling the government dishonest in regards to inflation. So the broader thing going on here is Riesman is trying to tell it like it is. He's trying to give an accurate picture of reality, the world, its problems, etc. This is a broadly good goal. All I can really say to defend this is that he backs it up with arguments. So it's not like he says this and moves on, it's he says this and 
has extensive arguments, and I think he's correct, and it's all reasonable. And but yes, it is. It is unconventional. It's rude. You're not supposed to talk that way. And he does not specifically explain why he talks that way. Like I think some of the cases Kersner's complaining about are clearly defensible conventionally. Like you can have a wrong and counterproductive preference. Look, put it this way. They have more than one preference, and their preference contradict each other. No, he's saying that you satisfy the preferences of the individual members of society when and to the extent that they have productive preferences, when you satisfy their preferences for self-immolation that isn't producing wealth. It may be satisfying their preferences, but their preferences are destructive. People can prefer destruction. When people prefer things compatible with human life, and that's provided, then that's wealth. When they prefer things incompatible with human life, and it's provided, that's still not wealth. David Deutsch has a definition of wealth, which is, it's basically how much control you have over reality, what transformations of reality you can do. Of course, being able to, to transform and control reality is uh, productive to the promotion of human life and well-being. So it's uh, compatible with Riesman's view. It doesn't radically differ. It's, it's a minor exception. He's just saying that a few self-destructive things don't constitute productive wealth. That is not a radical difference. Like, economic theory in general is going to come out the same. Right, Justin. Exactly. No matter how much people want the gas chambers, they do not constitute wealth in some sense. It's not the gas chambers itself, because... Those give you like a tiny bit of control over reality. You can do something with them, but it's the whole project is bad. And the project of the Holocaust broadly reduced people's ability to control reality, to produce goods, to have food and clothing and housing and so on, partly by killing some of the people who could build those things. So Kersner really wants to distance Riesman from Austrian econ. And he says Riesman certainly recognizes that Kersner is right. I believe Riesman recognizes no such thing. I would be quite surprised if Riesman thought his view of wealth was radically different and like Mises incompatible and anything like that. Like even if it's Mises incompatible, it's it's only it doesn't change the analysis of most economic activity and situations. Right? It's like a minor patch where you get a different evaluation of the Holocaust and of drugs, but you get the same evaluation of, you know, art, food, construction work, services, etc., etc. This is why, of course, the, the book has conclusions broadly compatible with Mises. It's pro-capitalist. It's, it broadly has the same sort of economic reasoning as Mises, because it's not this fundamentally different thing. It's very similar. Particularly Hayek? Where the fuck is he getting this? Is that right? And that takes us to the actual economics part. We need to not just allocate scarce means, but create means. So this is uh, quite a misleading quote. Contention rests on a logical fallacy. It does not see what gives rise to the economic study of choices and concerns. People have a virtually limiting. The allocation thing is terrible just because it says allo allocating. What about creating? I mean, we have scarce means for creating more means. I guess that's part of it, is how do you allocate some of the resources to further production? Maybe they mean it that way. The quote's misleading, though, because it, it makes it sound like the issue of economics is how do you divide up the pie of total wealth? Who gets what? Who gets to, have, who gets to consume what? How is that organized? Like, if what you're thinking about primarily is businessmen... I don't think people will get from this like that entrepreneurs are allocating scarce means, that is the capital that they borrow from friends and family or angel investors or whatever, or banks, that that is scarce means which they're allocating to the competing ends of consumers, that is not their own ends, but they think consumers want backpacks more than shoes, so they make some backpacks. 